Hello, gentle marketers. Welcome to the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we usually talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm. I'm Sarah Zanacroce. I'm the host of this show. And as you may have noticed, I'm hosting some more regular episodes right now in response to the current situation. So if this is your first time here, welcome. You are listening to a raw episode recorded with a returning guest, Steve Morris. And I want you to know that this is not your regular episode. I continue to post those on Fridays where we talk about gentle marketing. But right now I'm wanting to serve you, my community of gentle souls with resources that help us all deal with the current situation. So this is also an episode that is not posted on my website. So I recommend you subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app so you get notified about future extra episodes as I keep posting them. As I said, Steve Morris is a returning guest. We talked about the beautiful business in episode 12. So when Steve offered to come back for a conversation about beautiful questions in challenging times, I was of course delighted. And I think you will very much enjoy this conversation between Steve and I. So without further ado, here's Steve Morris. Steve, so good to have you back. Sarah, thank you so much for uh, making this place for this conversation during this uh, very interesting time. And it's a pleasure to be here to have uh, this beautiful conversation with you. Yeah, for those who don't remember Steve, he's a returning guest. We talked about the beautiful business in episode 12. So when you offered to come back for a conversation about beautiful questions in challenging times, I was, of course, delighted. So here we are. Yeah, difficult times for many of us. Like you just shared about um, the parks being closed in in San Diego and, and what that means, right, in terms of, yes, confinement, but also you, you kind of said, well, nature, we need it more than, than ever right now. Um, how do you see nature as being playing such an important part in, in, in beautiful business, but in, in beauty just in general? Mm, yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 the human dynamic and the human experience is paradoxical by nature in that uh, there is one part of us that is born into the, the primal biological world. And we humans uh, often forget uh, because of our beautiful intelligence that we actually come from the same biology that is made up of most of the natural world. And because of that, we're inextricably connected to it and therefore to the natural world and all the rhythms and the cadence and even the uh, dynamic beauty that exists within that in that. And then the other side of the human nature is, um, or the paradoxical nature of the human experience is the element that animates us and essentially all other human beings and living things. And that is the mystical forces that animate all living things. And the, those, both of those attributes to the human experience, which, is also, which are also attributes of, of the, um, the, the, the physical world, including nature, um, are built on this element of beauty that has to do with this creation and destruction side of things. Um, and also, you know, we really have no allergies or defenses for what natural beauty really can do for us. Uh, you know, those people who travel, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles to go see uh, a sunset over the Grand Canyon or to go to Machu Picchu or uh, to travel out, uh, although not during this time, but to travel out to see the face of a newborn child uh, in your in from one of the loved ones in your family, um, you know we really yearn for beauty in our lives. And the one of the challenging things that I'm witnessing is that when we're sequestered, as we most of us are right now, uh, we actually have to search for beauty a little bit more so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so how do we do that since now we're 
in our homes and we can't go outside of ourselves to find this beauty, mm. where do we find the beauty then? Yeah. Yeah. You know, some of us are blessed, uh, like myself, to live on the edge of a canyon or to have a window to look out and, you know, watch the clouds rolling by or the trees swaying in the wind or the birds doing what they're doing in uh, nesting right now in the season of spring. Um, but then there's other folks um, like our mutual friend Jenny Blake, who lives in New York City. And, you know, I don't know what the orientation of her window view might be. And maybe she has got a peekaboo view of the sky uh, or of Central Park uh, or something to that nature. But, you know, we can always bring beauty into our in, into our homes, into our inner worlds. And a friend of mine was telling me that when she goes out for her weekly grocery shopping right now, uh, she is sure to pick up at least a couple of handfuls of flowers and spreads them throughout her house uh, to remind her of her connection to both the natural world and to beauty. And, and, um, and I think there's, there's other ways to really tap into the beautiful side of, of things, such as the inner landscape of our own imagination. And I think, you know, one of the challenges during this time of being sequestered is that um, we're having less um, real physical uh, proximity and conversations with folks that we're used to being in, in close proximity to. And, you know, fear can take over in times of crisis. And so our imagination as human beings, I mean, we're pretty darn powerful. Uh, we can imagine all kinds of catastrophes. Uh, but we can also imagine all kinds of beautiful outcomes. And I think the questions that we ask ourselves during these times uh, can reorient our opportunity to uh, dial into the world that we see on the outside. Yeah, so, so you mentioned the inner world, and I want to go there. Uh, I just also wanted to mention two things that I uh, kind of picked up or or. I did them before, but I, I was like, oh, I have more time so I can uh, kind of use my creative brain a bit more than usual. And, and I uh, just picked up my knitting. I'm knitting a, a, a shawl right now. And I read this meme and I wish I would remember the exact text, but it had something to do with uh, knitting being the craft of our ancestors. And so in a way, it's this connection with uh, our ancestors, because clearly nowadays, you, you know, you usually buy everything at the store. And so you don't actually realize how things are made anymore. So I thought that was beautiful. In a way, it's like growing your own garden, which right now we can't do, but at least I'm making my own, you know, it's my own shawl. So that's one of the things. The other thing um, that I know that you're doing as well, and, and there's beauty in that is, is painting or mm -hmm. drawing or whatever other creative uh, thing that you may be crafting. So, so there can definitely be also be inside beauty that we create ourselves. And, uh, and painting is, is one of those things. Um, yes, yeah. yeah. Would you mind if I brought a little poetry into this conversation? Oh, please do. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I've been blessed and honored to uh, study and work with a wide variety of poets, and one of them is David White, and I spent a year with David and his uh, uh, group up in uh, Whidbey Island uh, off of Seattle, and uh, it was a group called the um, Institute for Conversational Leadership, and it really was all about language and ensouling language into the corporate world and bringing a new set of language um, of which the corporate world really doesn't have um, a strong set of language to deal with the soft skills of the human dynamics of, of who we are. And so David brings, um, uh, David and, and my dear friend Libby Wagner, um, they bring poetry into, into work. And um, I want to share a poem that uh, it's called Sweet Darkness by David White. And really the, 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 the concept of the poem deals with a wide variety of issues, but it really has to do with the context of what we're talking about, such as the inner landscape of our imagination. And so the poem goes, when your eyes are tired, the world is tired also. When your vision is gone, no part of you 
can find you. No part of the world can find you. It's time to go into the dark where the night has eyes to recognize its own. There, you can be sure you are not beyond love. Let the dark be your womb tonight, and the night will give you a horizon further than you can see. You must learn one thing. The world is made to be free in. Give up all the other worlds, except for the one to which you belong. Sometimes it takes darkness and the sweet confinement of your aloneness to learn that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. And again, that's a poem by David White uh, called Sweet Darkness. And darkness is a metaphor in the artistic world, uh, both in the painterly perspective and the writer perspective and the poet perspective and even the musical perspective of our very unique human imagination. And it's in that imagination where we have the fertile ground to formulate any new trajectory that we choose to. And you know, I have a saying that I use within some of the corporate work that I do, which is show me the questions that your organization asks itself and that are common within your organization. And I'll show you where the importance and the focus of that organization is. And I think it's true also for the human being uh, experience, especially at this point. And really people can identify or orient where they're at right now by the questions they're asking themselves. And if that's true, and because we have to, the choice to choose and corral and reattune our own imagination, we can also choose different questions which can reorient our perspective on our life, on our world, not just from an inward standpoint, but even from an outward standpoint. Mm, yeah, it's beautiful. I think what we're experiencing right now is, is really actually... In a way, we're being forced to ask ourselves these questions because most people, I would dare to say that we don't ever stop to actually sit down and ask ourselves any kind of questions. We are just in the doing trance, you know, uh, corporate um, employees, they're just doing, doing, doing and, and, and never actually maybe ask themselves any kind of these important questions. And so now we are in this darkness in a way and get to get the permission to just sit there and actually slow down and ask ourselves some of these questions where, you know, what is essential to, we, to me? What's important? What really matters? Uh, where I would bet that a lot of, people never actually think about would you agree I think with that? yeah I, I would absolutely agree with that and I think it's part of the self-care that we have to sort of really be cautious about deploying which you know uh, I was in a conversation yesterday with my friend Owen O'Sullivan who's a musician and he was using the um, one of the concepts that are sort of the mantras of the current day which is to wash your hands as a metaphor and this hand washing is a metaphor. It, it, it's a metaphor for this self cleansing practice, which because we're now being invited to sing happy birthday twice or whatever the song is that identifies the length of the hand washing, um, <laughs> it also turns into a bit of a ritual. And because rituals have meanings, we can actually bring a more, much more deeper or significant meaning meaning to the hand washing, which could have to do with a full cleansing of our attention and our orientation. And I think part of the self-care that would, would be most beneficial for a lot of people right now is to go inward and really care for your inner landscape and really ask yourself pointedly what type of questions do I want to be asking of myself right now? Should I be asking of myself right now? Um, you know, for instance, one of the things that I've had conversations around, uh, and, and a few people have come to me with this concept in the form of a question is, what if we saw this time 
that we're going inward during this crisis as an awakening, as a cleansing for our own imaginative world and a recalibration for how we connect with one another in our own humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it as well. And, um, and, and I think what needs to be addressed maybe is before we can go into these questions is, is definitely because what I see still a lot is, is the fear, right? And if you're still in the fear stage, then you probably are not open to ask yourself these questions yet. So, so self-compassion um, needs to first be used on, on the fear and accept the fear and sit with the fear. And then from there go into, okay, now I had this fear is here, but how can I go deeper and how can I then address yeah and, and see this as a, an opportunity rather than just something scary and bad yeah yeah you know it's really interesting too but it, it might be uh, what i have found in in conversations uh with business leaders that i'm talking to when when they get into that place of fear is to remind them that fear is a natural human uh emotion and that it's actually their fear and anxiety are there to protect us from real fears that are out into the world. And sometimes we spin off into fear-based lines of thinking or even questions. And I think it's really important to stop in that particular moment and ask yourself the question, that thing that you're fearing or the situation that is bringing up fear, to ask the question whether or not it's completely and utterly true mm. and 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 often it's it's not and and then the other side of that question leading into byron katie's work um if you're familiar with that and i'm sure your mm -hmm. listeners are or some of them at least is that you know the, the that question of is it absolutely positively true and do you absolutely positively know that it's true and then who would you be or what would the situation be different if it wasn't true? Right. And just the line of questioning in that gives us permission to imagine what a new set of questions are or imagine what the fear is trying to teach us or tell us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so essential to, to go there. Um, another thing you brought up is, is this concept of, since a lot of people right now, maybe they're, you know, losing their job or there's a lot of insecurity, uh, uncertainty around their job. And so they're, in a way, their, their self-identity is being, is at risk. They, they wonder, what if I lose this job? What's going to happen? And not only what's going to happen, but who am I, who am I without this job? And, it, and, I, and that, again, reminds me of this trans that we're so often in and we were, you know, kind of had the stamp on our head where we identify ourselves with our job title or with our, yeah, usually the job title or, or with our level of success, maybe even. Um, and so maybe this is also a time to ask ourselves these questions about our identity and who am I and what really matters to me? What can you add to, to that, Steve? Yeah, it's, again, I go back to the instructive power of nature. And, you know, when we take the, the overarching concept of creation and destruction and we go into the metamorphosis of the caterpillar into the butterfly, mm -hmm. um, you know, mo like even most grade school kids understand that metamorphosis that happens and, um, you know, the very simple process would be that the caterpillar, you know, gorges itself uh, on plants and leaves or whatever its appetite is, uh, and then cocoons itself into the pulpit. And, and then within that particular pulpit, it transforms uh, sort of into a milkshake-like substance, completely shedding all of what it previously was, except for some core foundational DNA things, and then emerges on the other side of that into this 
amazing flight ridden species that is completely transformed. And, you know, going back into David's poem, uh, Sweet Darkness, you know, he, he has the lines in there that says, you must learn one thing, the world is made to be free in, give up all the other worlds except for the one to which you belong. And then he says, sometimes it takes darkness in the sweet confinement of your, of your aloneness to learn that anything or anyone that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Mm -hmm. And if he were here to talk about that poem or those few last lines, he would say, and I've heard him say this, that sometimes your own self-identity is too small for what you were living before. And it's time to deconstruct what that was and, and shed uh, whatever the shell that confines you into your smaller version of yourself and allow yourself in, to emerge into this brighter more beautiful expression of who you are in, in that iteration of humanity. Mm, that's so beautiful. Yeah, I like that. And again, it, it reminds me that this time right now is, is, is probably an opportunity for, for many, because if, we, if things just work as they always work, even though they're bad, we are not encouraged to make any changes. So right now we're really given this opportunity to, to go into our cocoons and to hopefully transform into, into butterflies. And the other concept that comes together with this transformation is the, the imaginal cells, right? So mm -hmm. this idea of imaginal cells that are happening or that um, are in this cocoon that you don't even know they're there and yet they are at the source for a beautiful new beginning a beautiful new uh, you in a way so uh, i'm so grateful you brought brought this up because i i think about that a lot and i think that this time really will bring forward some imaginal cells even though right now we still see a lot of destruction and uh or, you know, sometimes questioning, well, you know, are we just going to go back to the way it was before? Mm. Um, but I truly believe that all these little imaginal cells eventually, um, you know, will turn into butterflies and it might not be right after this thing is over, but eventually those are the, the ones who are going to bring forward a, a new kind of way of being together. Yeah, it really begs the question, you know, because we know the power of humanity and our imagination to be able to create things. And all of that creation starts with uh, a conception, an idea, a kernel of a, of a thought that could become a thing that we manifest into uh, something that is physical or uh, a new sense of reality. And so the question that, or some of the questions that begin to emerge during this time is, okay, what we currently knew uh, likely as we come out on the other side of this will not be the same reality. What then is the new reality that we collectively want to create? And you know, the thing, you know, bringing just Darwin into it for just a quick moment, you know, a lot of people get Darwin wrong in that they quote him in saying that he was a, advocate of survival of the fittest uh, for, from an evolutionary standpoint. And the reality is um, he didn't talk about that very much. He mentioned that a couple times, but I think a lot of people put the spotlight on that. But what he really talked about was the ability to love and work in both collaboration, connection, and have the ability to adapt to circumstances in a group setting so that you can create this new future or create the next version of the evolution that we can imagine. And that is the most beautiful part or one of the most beautiful parts of our own humanity is that we can both imagine something and then have the will, the effort, and especially when we pull together to create it, we can manifest more or less anything that we can imagine. So the more I think aligned we are, I think the more connected we are, and the more we have faith in the efforts and, and the, the artistic and creative power of humanity, 
the more we can create a much more beautiful, much more prowess based world on the other side of all this. Mm, yeah. And you're also uh, in the middle of writing a book about the beautiful business. I'm writing a book about gentle marketing. Would you agree that it's actually a good time to write books with those kind of topics, even though right now one would think everything is falling apart? Mm, yeah, I, I, yeah, the, if I be perfectly honest, I wish my book was ready for the world today. Right. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think it's absolutely the time to plant the seeds of these types of imaginative ideas where we can see our world completely differently and have the ability to, to create those worlds differently. And I think it's, it's the kind of thinking that you're putting into your book and I'm putting into my book. And, and I know a wide variety of other people who are, who are making some very beautiful um, books uh, for, for the business world and actually for, for human um, you know, self-development, if you will. Uh, that the world is, I, I believe, hungry for. And I believe the world is always hungry for beauty. Uh, like I said, we seek it everywhere we can find it. Um, and it's one of those things that can arrest our experience and transform us. Mm -hmm. So yes, to your question, I, I do wish, uh, and I, I do wish that the book was done right now. I'm not going to rush it along. I'm actually, uh, as you asked that question, I had a conversation yesterday about how much um, of today's circumstances should I really be folding into the book as I'm now 80, 85% done with it? Uh, will I have to go back and edit certain chapters to mm -hmm. fold in some of the experiences of the now? Yeah. Uh, I don't have an answer for that at this point, but, but I agree. I think, you know, the book that you're writing, the book that I'm writing, the book that uh, a handful of other people that I'm, I know of are writing, uh, the world, I believe, is going to be very hungry for those things. I believe so, too. You also talk uh, about leadership quite a bit, um, mm -hmm. not to go into politics, but, um, you know, we definitely question certain leaders right now all over the world. Um, and what I've noticed also in, in certain countries, um, we need to really step up and self-lead in, in these kind of moments uh, of crisis, because if we always wait for our leader to, you know, come out with the right message, then, then you know, maybe that's n not exactly what we should be doing. Um, but besides politics, what do you, where do you see a softening maybe also on the leadership level um, coming out of the other side of this? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you know, one, of the, one of the ways I define leadership uh, is to cast a vision for whomever the leader is leading, uh, be it a, a country, a, a, a state, a city, a, a company, a family, uh, or one's self, uh, but to cast a vision for what, what things can be and what the world can look like as that group of people go and achieve that vision. And then also remove obstacles and, and make way for those things to manifest and to, you know, for that group of people to pull together to make that happen. And, you know, one of the things that we're seeing uh, certainly in, um, in the political landscape is that the vision isn't clear and the removing of obstacles isn't necessarily in place. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm much more of an advocate of um, controlling what you can and not getting spun out of the things that you really don't have too much control over, such as you know uh, what a, 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 pertin, a, a, a certain political member might do and, and things of that nature. Certainly, I'm going to vote uh, like everyone else should. But you know, my own self leadership. So leadership stop, starts with the self. How am I leading my own um, mindset? My uh, how am I leading my approach to self care? Um, how am I leading the people that I'm um, responsible for? And then how can I help influence other leaders? And, you know, I think that, you know, if, if we're aligned in the idea that leadership is to, to cast a vision, the soft side of that potentially, or one of the soft sides of that is to embrace 
influence and perspective from the folks who are part of the, the organization that you're leading and have them chime in on what their envisioned future am, is and what their level of responsibility is in bringing that into manifest or into reality. Mm -hmm. And the more that they chime in on that, uh, which is much more of a flat style organization, the more they actually take responsibility for their own self-leadership or managerial leadership or leadership of a project within an organization and own the outcome of those things. When one has a say in what the future can be like, one is much more invested into making those things happen. And I think that style of leadership, uh, at least in corporate life or in the business world, is becoming much more uh, activated. Uh, it doesn't happen in all organizations. And I think the bigger the organization, the more difficult that is to pull off. But I'm seeing that more and more. Yeah, so totally agree. And, and, and I would even say that also, so that's not just within the company, but also with our clients, we are aiming for inclusion and, uh, you know, what the conscious client today wants, he wants to belong to something. He wants to be heard and seen. So it's not just within the company. Uh, it's also with our clients. And, and that's different today as well. Before we, uh, you know, we would just say we are this brand and this is our truth and we're broadcasting basically our message. And that just doesn't work anymore. So in terms of our branding or our messaging, we're also have, being asked to be different kind of leaders uh, as a company or, or, or as, a, as a brand. So I, I definitely see that in a, in, a, in a way, it reminds me of this concept of a leader in an, each chair. So really thinking we're all somehow leaders and we don't need um, just one person, you know, saying this is how it is, but really including everyone. And I think you're, yeah, you're right. It's going to be a more of flat, flat kind of hierarchy. Um, yeah. That doesn't yeah. make sense. Flat hierarchy. And in that, um, in that flat uh, organization style, you know, the, the leader responsibilities shift to holding the center and ensuring that there is a, uh, a belief system that can orchestrate that the holding of that center so that the individuals responsible for their own either small team or self-leadership uh, are living up to the values of the organization. And because they're, you know, if an organization operates from a particular set of values, then they then have the opportunity to self-govern and self-lead within that value system. And it ends up being more like principles and guardrails than directives, um, which is much more inspiring from a motivational standpoint. And I find that to be much more of a humanistic approach to uh, both allowing uh, leaders to emerge and allowing people to have uh, agency, if you will, over their own life and uh, a sense of mastery in, in the creation of their own destiny. Right. Wow. Do you want to kind of end with one final thought or, or question, maybe since we talked about questions um, that people can, yeah, sit with in meditation or just kind of yeah, sit in the darkness and think about over these coming weeks, what mm. would you prompt them with? Yeah, I think there's a couple of ideas that are certainly um, emerging. Uh, you know, I consider myself a professional noticer. And, you know, uh, what I'm trying to do is notice the commonalities between some of the conversations that I'm having with business leaders and uh, teams that I'm working with. And one question that seems to be emerging or one idea that seems to be emerging, if I were to form it in, in a question is, what promises can you make yourself here and now? What promises can you make for yourself so that you hold close those things that matter most to you during this time of deep inward reflection and 
And as we emerge on the other side of this, how do you live up to those promises to implement those things when the world is ready for them? Mm, beautiful. I like that. What are you grateful for today or, or this week, Stu? Uh, I, am, um, I am so grateful for a really handful of things. The, the connection to nature, I, I feel incredibly blessed that I have this connection to nature. Uh, I wrote a blog the other day about uh, sitting out on the edge of my canyon and watching two hawks uh, circle almost at eye level because I'm up on a canyon edge and they were circling and the the sun was setting behind them and their feathers and wings were translucent with light and they circled and circled and circled closer and closer and closer to me so I could see every detail of both their beauty and their fierceness uh, the talons of their of their claws and the sharpness and their close focus of their eyes um, and also the beauty of the dance that they were uh, swirling upon the wind. Uh, I am utterly grateful for the beauty that exists within that. And I'm also very, very grateful to be sequestered with my family and that we're, we have the ability to connect and con console one another and create solace in the world that we're living right now and here. Mm, beautiful. What about you, Sarah? What are you grateful for? Yeah, kind of similar things. I'm, I'm grateful about the forest baths that I get to take every day. Um, the Japanese concept of, of basically walking in a forest. And I'm uh, also very appreciative of the fact that I can still go out and there's a forest and there's a little river that goes through the forest. So, so just being outside and being reminded that nature is this anchor that's there for me. Um, and then yes, being grateful for the fact that, you know, we are all together and, and all the things that I count as essential in my life are, are there for me. So, and for those things, I'm, I'm very grateful and I'm grateful for this conversation and being able to, to share it with uh, my community. So thank you so much for, for suggesting this beautiful conversation with beautiful questions and thanks for taking the time, Steve. Where it's my pleasure, Sarah. And, and I, I too am grateful for that, for us to be able to reach out across the world and have a meaningful conversation and then be able to share that with the, uh, a wide variety of other amazing human beings who are uh, dealing with no doubt some of the similar things that we're grappling with. So thank you. Exactly. Please do share where people can find out more about you and talk about your, your beautiful um, business book and the mm -hmm. TEDx video. Yeah, so uh, it's very easy to find me. Uh, my new website is matterco.co, M-A-T-T-E-R-C-O dot C-O. And uh, that's really the hub and the home of uh, my consultancy work and my writings. There's free downloads. Uh, there's hundreds of articles there um, and a bunch of free sharings that I, that I liberally share with the entire world. Um, and there, if you're interested, you can sign up for uh, the newsletter that I send out. Um, I send out, you know, probably three or four blogs a month and um, tends to be very short. And I tend to look at things as an offering of service and value. So thank you for that. Thank you. And, and if you enjoyed this conversation, you'll also enjoy episode 12 when we uh, talked about the beautiful business. Thanks so much, Steve, for taking the time. Thank you, Sarah. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let us know, Steve or me. Uh, you can reach us on LinkedIn or on our website. And why not share it with one of your friends, one of your peers, in the hope that it will also inspire them to kind of ask themselves these beautiful questions. And a review on iTunes would also always make my day. So thank you for that. And please do join us again um, later this week. I will also be posting 
a conversation with my fl- friend Laurel, who's going to share ho- her knowledge and point of view um, in what's going on in terms of astrology. And then later on, I have a call scheduled with Amy Carroll, who's a communication coach, and we'll look at uh, her concept that's called partner. And it's very specific to the current situation because we do find ourselves, you know, confined often with our partners. And, and, and so that impacts our relationship. It impacts our communication with our partners. And so I think this is going to be very helpful for all of us, including me, who are living with a partner and who are now spending more time with uh, him, her uh, in this specific and special time that we are in right now. So uh, please, if you haven't subscribed yet to the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, do that now, because again, I'm not sharing these on my website. It's really just raw content that only goes directly to uh, Libsyn, which is then shared by the different uh, podcasting apps. Thanks so much for listening and talk to you again soon. Take care.